Okay, so we're on last Lamed Aleph, Lamed Aleph. Um, we finished off the suya last week um, when we talked about um, the uh, the principle Hashem Tishivim and what Hashem Tishivim stands for. The, in other words, the double wording of Hashem Tishivim comes to tell us that Hashavas Aveda uh, is an add-on to the normal mitzvah. And therefore, we concluded that for Hashavah Saveda, you don't have to make certain announcements. You can remember the Gemara said you can just sort of slip it into his uh, into his garden without telling him, because it's not like returning a uh, an object that one may have stolen, which you have an obligation to return and put it into the hands of the owner. So Hashavah Saveda is a big mitzvah, but it's a mitzvah also that we don't put extra pressure on the finder. And we allow him to do the minimal amount and still fulfill the mitzvah. So that, that's how we concluded the Gemara. And now the Gemara, interestingly enough, for the next uh, sort of uh, dot or so, is going to take from the Torah various double doubled words and explain to us why in each case there is a need for doubling. In other words, like you said, Hoshev Tishibain, right? That's a doubling. And we said we need it. So now the Gemara is one, two, I think three lines uh, into the wide lines of, of the bottom of Laman Aleph, Laman Aleph, about the middle, a little past the middle. It's the Shalach to Shalach. Okay, so that, that's where we're going to start. And each one is a different, um, each one is a different Pasuk in the Torah. All right, so let's get started. Shalach to Shalach. The Torah tells us by Shluch HaKain that when you... Um, want to, to take the eggs of a bird, you have a mitzvah to uh, shoo away the mother so that the mother should not be present when you're taking the birds. And it's kind of obvious that we don't want the mother to, to have pain, so to speak, right? When, when they see that her eggs are being taken away. So the, the kasha in all of these questions is why the doubling of the word? Shalach, the shalach, you should surely cast it away. And so the, the kasha is how many times you have to do it? The answer is as many times as the bird comes back. Ema, shalach, chada, zimna, tishalach, tre, zimna. Same kasha we had before. Why not only twice? Once for shalach, or once for tisha, for tishla. And after the second time, you're free. Why, why not? Omalach, shalach, hafidu, meyafamim, mashma. A hundred times. If that bird keeps coming back, you got to keep pushing it away. Uh, what do we do with Tishalach? Tishalach, only Elila Devar HaRishus, Devar Mitzvah Menayin, Amanoma Tishlach Mikoma. So here the Gemara gives us an interesting answer. I would have thought that, you know, when you have to shush away, when it's for Devar Rishus, let's say you want to take those eggs and you want to use them, which you're allowed to. So I think, okay, if I want to use the eggs, then I have to, I, I can't insult or, or, or pain the mother. I've got to move her away and, and use the, the eggs. But what about a divine mitzvah? There is a mitzvah to take a bird and to slaughter it and bring a carbon in order to heal its saras, right? And Rashi tells us, Rashi says over here, um, okay. Uh, what does it say? says Rashi, she ain't sarach for ela la achila. means I only need it for food, so for that I have to move away the mother. The dvar mitzvah menayin, a yitzarach letaher bo is a mitzora. You're being metayer the mitzora. Menayin she osa beaim al abanim. How do you know that we need a bird? How do you know that you can't take the bird with them, the mother with the uh, with the eggs? Because it's a big mitzvah. Therefore, the second word tishlach tells us that even for a divar mitzvah, like for instance to heal the mitzvah, you're not allowed to use the mother. You have to shoo her away. So now the word tishlach has a different meaning. It means to include divar mitzvah. Amaleahu medrabana larava. So, okay, so that, that was the end of that portion. So in other words, we have a, we have a, a shalach to tishlach, and we see that what, what the, um, 
uh, what, what the case may be. I'm sorry, I, I don't quite understand. Um, so it, it says shalach tishlach. How do we learn that it's more than twice? I mean, okay. Whenever you have a repetitive word, there's a reason why the word is repeated because shalach. So shalach is once. Shalach tishlach means twice. I mean, just like the Gemara was positing. How do we learn differently? I, I missed it. Right. right. So, so the kasha was if shalach is one and tishlach is two. How do we know? How do we know? And in fact, we do know. We do and how know. do we? I'm sorry, I missed. I don't quite get. It. So how do we know? So no, no, no. The question is this: We know that that you have to remove the mother even. I feel me me How do you learn me apamim from shalach tishla? How do you learn that? How do we know it? How do we? How, know do, we, how do we know it to begin with? Why do you say we know? It? Because okay, so we take so Chazal tells us Rashi brings down on the Pasik that Chazal says it means even a hundred times. Okay, so so then but, how do okay. so we're accepting we're accepting that as the norm? And All the right. question is how do we learn it from the Pasik? The Territ says Shaleyah tells us that it's already a hundred times. A hundred times. Shaleyah tells us it's a hundred times. Oh, the, we don't need Tishlach to tell us that. Shaleach tells us you you got to return it. Uh, you got to do it as many because times. it's ambiguous. Because it doesn't list uh, a finite number, it right. therefore is okay. Right. And why do we need Tishlach? Why do we need Tishlach? Tishlach comes to tell us that you might have thought, you might have thought that if you need it for a varushus, meaning I want to eat the uh, I, I want the young. I want to take the eggs. I want to take them with me. I'm allowed to take them, and I move away the mother. That's okay. How do I know that for dvar mitzvah, that because this bird is needed for a mitzvah, for a mitzvah, how do I know that I can't use the mother and the eggs if I want to fulfill a mitzvah? I'm taking the eggs, but the mother is also part of the mitzvah of, of I need a bird for the sacrifice for the mitzvah. Okay. So how do I know that you can't, even for a mitzvah, you can't use it? You have to send her away anyway, right? Her yeah, pain is exactly. more important than, than the mitzvah in front. Than the, mit, than the mitzvah itself. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. It's more yeah. important than the mitzvah itself. And that's why you need it twice. That's why you need it twice. Right. And actually, I was thinking that you might not think that would necessarily be the case because we have plenty of situations with like Corbanos on Shabbos and things like that where not say right. Dofe Losa say. So we need to really know, know that that's we the really case. We need to know it. So the, the, okay. the Tishla has to come to tell us what we might not otherwise know, as you say. Right. Okay, so 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 now we answer the the question by Shalayat Tishla. Okay, So in the course of this lecture that Rava was giving, one of the Rabbanon said to Rava, "The Ema Hochiach Choda Zimna Turkiach Tre Zimna." So now we have another pasuk. The pasuk says that when you see someone doing something improper, you have to warn him, and the Torah lashon is Hochiach Turkiach. Double lashon, you have to warn him. Same kasha. Why do you? Why the repetition of a What's pshat? Says the Gemara. Same thing. That by hocheach is an unlimited number of warnings. You can't say I warned him once. I warned him twice. It's enough. Every time there's an opportunity, you have to warn him what he's doing is improper. Tochia, the word tochia, only Elo Harav le Talmud, Talmud le Rav Benayin, Talmud Lomar Tochia, Tochia, the Kol Makom. Very interesting that Tochia Tochia is not a one-sided affair. It definitely means that a Rebbe should be mindful of his Talmudim, of course, but it also means that when you see a, 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 a rub or an older person or a, even a Talmud Chacham doing something that seems improper, you have a mitzvah to give him a warning. Now, clearly, you have to do it with their acherets, you have to do it with the right kind of uh, approach, but it doesn't mean that someone who is a guttle bigger than you is, is given a pass that he doesn't have to be warned. So the Torah gives us that admonition that hocheach tochiach, even someone who is a, 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 a Talmud Larav, where the Talmud is going to give the Hasra, the Hachiach, to the Rav, it's okay, it's included. So that, that's a Chiddush. It's a Chiddush. You might have thought, listen, you know, you shouldn't, um, 
you shouldn't warn. Derek says, no, you always warn, but you have to do it with a sensitivity. Look, both ways you have to do it with sensitivity. But when you're doing it from a from a from a Talmud to a rub, it especially has to be done in a way because of the uh, the the, the gravitas of the um, of the rub. Okay, now so that's the second case. Now the Gemara goes it tells us a different a different possible. The Torah tells us Azov Tazo. Okay, what's Azov Tazo? Now this has to do with our with our sugya. Okay that uh, the Torah tells us that when you see, and he quotes a Pasuk, um, he quotes a Pasuk in Shemos, the Pasuk says, if you see the donkey of your uh, enemy, that he's laboring under his, um, his burden, right? And you refrain, you don't want to help him. You have to, go ahead and help him. And then even if it's your enemy, he's not someone that you would otherwise have anything to do with it. But if you see his, his donkey or his animal or, or whatever laboring, then you have a mitzvah of Ozov Tavis. Frank the Gemara, Ozov Tavis. So why do you need it twice? What's Pshat? Eli Elo, Eli Elo Balav Imo. It says Ozov Tavis Imo, that you have to uh, help with him. Who's the him? The owner, meaning the the person that you don't like, right? So, so only el balav imo she ain't balav imo menayin. What happens if you're walking along and the bal isn't there? Are you mechuyev? It says you mechuyev to help the owner take care of his animal. But if he's not there, let's say he went off skiing in, in Switzerland, and 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 his animal is sitting over there and has a, a burden, and the burden has, has broken down, and it's sitting there. Uh, do you have a chiyuv to help the animal if the owner isn't there? Talmud Loma, Ozov Tavov, Mikol Marko. There it is. The mitzvah on you is independent of the owner. Even though it says emo, but if there's no emo, you still have a chiyuv to, to, um, to go ahead and, and help them. Rabbi, does that also include, is it only for a, a teacher? What about for a parent or a king? Or No, no it's, it's inclusive of any relationship in which the person giving hasra is, it does not have the same uh, sort of, the, the, is not at the same level, doesn't have the same gravitas as the person giving it, whether it's a rab, whether it's a Talmud to a rab, or a child to a parent. In other words, it's an unequal, it's an unequal relationship. So it's a relationship that where you're where you're going up, not down. So when you're going up, it's always harder to give musr, right? It's always harder for you to give musr to your parent or give musr to, to the rub of the shul or to give musr, let's say, even even on a, on a on a bigger sense, let's say you have the ear of the president of the United States. Are you gonna tell the president of the United States? Um, you know, what are you gonna tell him? I mean, you're right, you're going to be very careful. Teretz is, pacheach tachiach means you have an obligation within the context of the relationship, you have an obligation to give hasra, to give a warning. Sometimes that warning has to be very carefully given. You can't just blurt out and say, you're an, you know what, you're an idiot. What you're doing is foolish. You wouldn't say that. You would say, you know, Mr. President, there, there is this issue, uh, however you want to put it, you put it in a more delicate way, but the Torah tells us no one is immune from it. Even a person on a very high plane is not immune from being given a hasra, from being given a warning that what he's doing is not correct. And that's the- By the way, thing. Rabbi, Rabbi, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the president of the shul is definitely not uh, not on that plane where people uh, people <laughs> hesitate to give, uh, to give right. hasra, believe right, me. Right. And, and by the way, hasra is one of the hardest <laughs> things to give because you have to have a certain sense of, 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 of respect, even if you feel someone is doing something out, so outrageous that he should be given a patch rather than, than a word. You, you have to do it with respect and you have to do it with a certain dignity. So, and, and you know what? Sometimes that may get lost in the warning. If, you're not, if, if you don't give the warning strong enough, then maybe the warning doesn't even take hold because the person doesn't realize he's being warned. So it's one thing when a parent tells a child, sometimes they're very direct, or a Rebbe tells a student, 
they're being very direct. They're telling you, you know, no in certain terms. But when the tables are flipped and, and you have to tell the Rebbe something, you know, the Rebbe may not be macabre. The Rebbe may not be so happy to hear that, uh, you know, he's getting a subtle, let's call it, uh, warning. So you have to you have to do it with, you know, very careful. Yeah, Rabbi yeah, Graham, I, go ahead. It, it's worthwhile mentioning that uh, during the Levaya, Rabbi Rosenbaum, in fact, acknowledged this very thing. He said that there were three instances in which Rabbi Hyatt had to tell me that I was wrong about something. And he said, number one, in fact, I was wrong, but number two, the way in which he told me and the, you know, the, the cupboard he gave me in telling me uh, was, was deeply appreciated. He actually mentioned that very thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think that's a very close of a thing and it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing to negotiate. So um, we, we all have to be mindful that when that comes up, you have to be very smart and careful uh, and, and, and how you do it. Okay. How about Rabbi in connection with the Azov Tazov uh, Emo? I think we learned once in connection with that, that if the owner who is your enemy is present and he doesn't want to help do it, he just wants you to do to take the obligation on yourself to help with the animal and he's not willing to help along with it, you don't have to do it. Right. And 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 th that also comes out in, in, in one of the next lines too, David. You're absolutely right. In other words, the question of emo is A, is he there? or is he absconding, or B, is he there and he doesn't want to do the work and he wants you to do the work. So th you're right, that, that word emo is, 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 um, is, is something that we have to understand clearly when it says that you have to help him. So what does the him mean? Exactly right. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, then hakim talking. Now, we have the next pasuk, the pasuk, uh, in other words, if the animal is already lying on the ground, right? The animal's lying on the ground, and now you want to, um, you have to pick it up because it's, it's under its burden. So the Torah says uh, that, that, um, uh, the Belashan is, Lotiras Chamor Achicha, we did this already in Devarim. You shouldn't see Chamor Achicha, Shara Noflim Baderech. Vihisalamta, the famous Vihisalamta, and you look away. Hakim Takim Emo, you have to raise up the animal. And again, it says the word emo. It says it with, with the uh, with the uh, owner. Ainly Elabal of Emo. So I would think this to David to your point only if the if the Baal is there. Sha'in Baal of Emo Minayan. How do you know if the Baal is not there, you have to do it? Because, like you said, I mean. Go, go and find some hired workers, pay them and let them do it. Why, why should I be to do this Alpine mitzvah when the owner himself could have either done it himself or hired a couple of workers to do it? So in other words, where is my achrayas in this whole thing? Talmud Lomar, Hakim Takim, Mikol Makom. So therefore it says, under any circumstance, you have to help. In other words, you can't taina, he could have gone to someone else paid him a couple of bucks, and he would have done it. In other words, you should relish the opportunity to do the mitzvah uh, by yourself. So, so now we see that this mitzvah applies by Ozov Tazov and Hakim Takim, which means, in our language, when the animal falls down or when the animal has to be put up. Frank the Gemara, Volomele Lemichta, Prika, Volomele Lemichta, Te'ina. Prika means that, that um, when the animal falls down, you have to unburden it. And te'ina means when it's already down, you have to um, saddle it. So now the Gemara asks a good kasha. Why do you need both? Karika and te'ina are two sides of the same issue. So let us learn one and we'll know the other. Why do we have to have both? And for the Gemara, it's rika. We need karika and we need te'ina. We need hakim takim. We need both sukim. Also tavav and hakim takim. Why? The Iksiv Rachmona Parika, if the Torah would have only told us Parika, Hapa Amina, I would have thought that there are superseding points about Parika that make it required. What are those points? The Iketsar Bale Chaim, because remember, when the animal is falls down, it's got these packages on its back which are causing the animal pain. So forget about just unburdening it. The, the animal is in pain, and we have a mitzvah 
to avoid Tsar Balachayim. So you know why we have to do Parika? Because Tsar Balachayim. Also, they can chesor and kiss. There is a loss of money to the owner. Why? And Rashi will explain. Because um, the animal gets weakened by the fact that is um, uh, but by, by the fact that it has this burden weighing on it. So Rashi says, Ozov Tazov is Parika, Ochim Tokin is Teina, Chesorin Kis, Shabahema Miskalteles. The longer the Behema sits with, with the burden on its back, the weaker it gets. So th there's two good reasons. One is Tsar Balachayim, the second is Chesorin Kis, because the animal will no longer be as strong as it was before if it has to sit there with the baggage. So that's why the Torah said, Ozov Tazov, you can't leave it there. But lifting up the lav tsar balachayim. There is no tsar balachayim when the animal is unburdened and you have to now saddle it. Right? Below chesor and kiss. And there's no loss of money because the animal is not weakened. Ika, a malo, below chesor and kiss, ika, a malo, I would say, what? No, you, you have no chiyu to do te'ina, because in te'ina you don't have tzar balachayim, and you don't have the other, tzar and kis. So that's the reason why we have to say parika. The e ash and te'ina, forget about it. Let's just say te'ina, and we'll learn parika from that. The mishum de b'schar, because it's because it's with schar. In other words, there's a machlekes in the Gemara, and we're going to see that in a minute, whether or not te'ina really is a mitzvah that a person has to um, uh, participate in, or whether he can demand, or whether he can get money. Why? Because te'ina is a regular mundane service. You have an animal, you need to saddle it, okay? I don't know how to saddle an animal, or I can't do it myself. I bring over a couple of guys, give them a couple of bucks, help me saddle it, fine, now we're good. That's the norm. So I might have thought, I might have thought, the Yashmin and Tina Mishum de Bishar. Teina, there's no mitzvah really. You hire a couple of guys and they load the animal. That's what everybody in the world does. Avul Prika, the Bechinum. But since Prika is Bechinum, you, you don't have to pay anybody. Why? Because we just said this Sar Balachayim, this Kasar and Kis, Ama Lo. I would think, no, that the Pasik, that you don't have to do it. Therefore, tzricha. you need both. In other words, you need each one to tell us a chiddish. You need one to tell us a chiddish that, that, um, that um, th the reason why you do it is because it's Sarbala Chaim and Sarin Kiz. And we need Te'ina to tell us, because I would have thought that Te'ina is, you don't, have to, you don't have to give free time because the owner has an achayas to load his animal. He should, he should hire some people. How would I know a Perika then? Al-Nagloma, the Torah has to tell us both Parika and Te'ina, because each one has a different property. Okay, so, so, th that's, so that's the Gemara's terrace as to why it's necessary to say both. With the Rab Shimon, and according to Rab Shimon, the Amaaf Te'ina, Bechinam. Okay, that's, that's, there's a machloikis. There's a machloikis whether Te'ina has to be Bechinam. In other words, we just took the position that Te'ina loading is Bechinam. Why? It, because because um, uh, because a person can go ahead and hire other people, he doesn't. There's no mitzvah. A quarter of Shimon, that's not true. Even though he can hire other people, you have to fulfill the mitzvah of teina of of raising that animal up. Okay, so so Rab Shimon takes that position. So then now we're back to the kasha. Why do we need teina and parika? Let's just say te'ina, and we know parika, because even te'ina is a mitzvah. The Gemara before said it's not a mitzvah because, it, 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 because he can go and hire somebody. According to Rav Shimon, it is a mitzvah. He doesn't have to hire anybody. You have the mitzvah. Um, um, and to the Gemara, Rav Shimon, lo masay me kra. In other words, according to, the, according to Rav Shimon, he says, that uh, that pasuk is not germane, uh, and therefore, um, therefore he, he, he according to him it's not even uh, it's not even it's not even shy for So in other words, it's not a kasha according to Rav Shimon, but nevertheless uh, we need both of them. 
we need both of them to tell us that um, that um, uh, that um, we're mechuyim. Yeah. So in other words, according to Rav Shimon, Karika and Teina merge into one sort of one, and, and you, can, you you don't define it. You can't define it. Is I think the best way to explain it. Um, Rashi says. Um, Rashi says. Okay, so uh, that, that's that other man, the Omer, the Te'ina is Bishar and Prika is Bechinam. Lo Masai Mikro, Hai Mashma, Hai Mashma Te'ina, the Hai Mashma Prika, they mean each other, right? The Ikosav Choda, Hava Amina Mikrika, also, Abu Te'ina Lo, Kosav Rachmona, Idach Te'ina. In other words, when it says Prika and Te'ina, you can confuse them one for the other. So, according to Rab Shimon, you can't really define Prika or Te'ina, therefore, um, therefore, it's not a kasha. Because the kasha was, we see that um, even, even um, Te'ina requires specific um, uh, action. Teretz is, no, we don't know. We don't know what Te'ina is. We don't know what Prika is. In, in any event, we need the Pusik for both because they are different concepts, and each one requires a mitzvah. In other words, there are people whose reasons not give the mitzvah. Okay, they see an opportunity for a mitzvah, they have a mitzvah. I, someone else can do it, and and you don't have to do it, or or, or else someone else should do it, and you sh and you don't have to do it. Right? According to this one man, um, he should really go out and pay a laborer to to uh, to lift the animal. The terrorist is that even with teina, where it would seem to be not as powerful because you're loading the animal the animal isn't hurting no one is no one is really getting hurt here there's still the Torah tells us there's a mitzvah to help someone load an animal we should take that as a as a prima facie mitzvah and we should go ahead and help the animal notwithstanding that it's not let's say as complicated or as as big a mitzvah if you if you will okay i'm not saying it but maybe parika is a is a is a more difficult mitzvah because you're dealing with tarbalachayim and other things and to Ina, you're not. But in either event, Talmud Loimer, you're Mechuyah to do the mitzvah. Tuvia, uh, Quirky, um, it's implicit, yeah. I would guess, in any of these cases, that you yourself must be able bodied. So if you're going to get a killer, uh, you know, by lifting and you can't, you, are you Mechuyah to share the payment with him if, he got, if he's got to hire a guy to do it, actually, and there's nobody else around? Oh, so it's a very good question because number one, we could be speaking about a zakein. We could be speaking about an elderly person or a chosh of a person to whom the mitzvah wouldn't apply because uh, remember what we said about a zakein, an older person, he doesn't have that same chiyuv even on his own animal because, because of his gravitas or because of his status or simply because he's too old and can't do it. Yeah. So in other words, if you can do it and participate, of course you have to participate in the mitzvah. But even if you can't participate, then the question, what does emo mean? Emo means with him. So l'chaira, emo, he has to start the process and someone has to help him. But if he can't start the process because he's not capable, that doesn't absolve you to be the one to be helping him, even if he can't help himself. So you're right, l'chat chila, emo means, don't just stand there, smoke a cigar, and let somebody else do the work. Of course not. But you have to do it, and then someone will help you. But if you can't do the work, for whatever reason, it's too heavy, you have an illness, you're a zakeng, that doesn't absolve someone else from saying, oh, wait a minute, Ruben is not putting a finger on it. I'm not doing anything. Why should I do if he's not doing it? That's not part of the equation. The equation is that you have to help because there's a mitzvah, and emo to the extent that he should participate, he needs to participate. But we never look behind his motive. We don't say, oh, he's not participating, so it's no mitzvah. We don't say that because do we know why he's not participating? He may have a legitimate reason for not participating. So, so now the, the point is that the mitzvah is on you and never look at, at, at someone else as to why he's not doing. But it's a legitimate question. The question is legitimate. Why should I exert myself and do it when someone else can do it. Or as David pointed out earlier, he can hire someone for a few shackle. He can hire a worker, give him a few bucks and let him do the work. And why should I do it? So 
the, the, the point is that when by the Torah repeating the words twice, it's giving us an opening in it to understand the extent that we have to fulfill the mitzvah. From one word alone, we, the superficial meaning of the mitzvah might get lost. But because it's doubled down, that doubling down is what gives us the, the insight as to why it is a mitzvah on us. In other words, you have that Achrayas. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Excuse me, Rabbi. It's okay. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, why by certain mitzvahs you have to be reminded with double words? There's so many other mitzvahs that don't have double words on them. And, and there's apparently no reason to have double words. So, so, so the, the, yeah, no, that's a good question. And, and again, we can compare and, and see different mitzvahs. But usually, usually when there's a double word, it's because there's a little bit of a, 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 a crack in, in, the, in, the, in the continuity where one might say, you know what, this doesn't apply to me, or the mitzvah is the mitzvah, but I'm kind of like on the outskirts of the mitzvah. And so give me an example when you say that there are mitzvahs that are so clear, we don't need the doubling of the word because you can't confuse them and say, you know what, this mitzvah doesn't apply to me. So that it's usually a mitzvah that comes to teach us a lesson that we might not otherwise know if we only had one word. That, that's the shot here. We'll see it from all the others and we're gonna continue on. You'll see that each one of these has a doubling for a reason. But if you have one, give me, give me an example of, um, of a mitzvah. So if you take the mitzvah at Sitzis, you could also create scenarios that would be confusing and yet there's no double words there or it's fill in or other kinds of mitzvahs, Shabbos. I mean, there's the 600 and uh, what, 10 or so mitzvahs that, that it's fair to ask, why are they so clear? And these couple that we're talking about here yeah. have this little crack. It's just hard to... Yeah. So, so with the difference. Yeah. Well, uh, again, I mean, it, once we drill down on the mitzvah, uh, it may become clear why why every mitzvah is not double. But uh, in, in, in the in the, um, the minds of Chazal, um, one word alone should suffice, and in some cases it doesn't. I guess that's really sort of the the um, the barometer that by tefillin or tzitzis or 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 even by mitzvahs like mezuzah, all those other mitzvahs. Uh, the, the Torah makes it clear that's the Ephraim. I guess maybe by tzitzis you can argue, you know what, the mitzvah of tzitzis, but what happens if I don't wear a baguette? If I don't wear a baguette, I don't need to put on tzitzis. I mean, technically you're correct. You're correct. If you don't wear a baguette of, of Arba Kantos, then you, you don't have to. The question is, is there a mitzvah to wear a baguette to, to, to so, so the l'chaira, that's not the mitzvah. The mitzvah is not to wear a baguette and therefore be required arba kantos. The mitzvah is when you have a baguette of four corners, you have to put on the tzitzis. There are many, many times when, when uh, in fact, um, uh, the, the, the answer to the question, how do you avoid tzitzis, is taking one of the corners and snipping it off so that you don't have arba kanfos, you don't have four squared corners. So you see that Chazal even tell us that, you know what, it's a mitzvah to have tzitzis, but if you have a beggar that doesn't have four corners, don't go out of your way to necessarily find a beggar of four corners. So in that I, case, you wouldn't have to. Have I, I, I have a, a little bit of a theory, whether I'm sure somebody far better than me has either proven or disproven it, but just throw, throw this out there. Most of the things that we've been talking about so far are things that are, interpersonal relationships or even if it's with the the bird shalach to shalach where it's like you know representative the idea of chesed and so this extra emphasis where you need that extra push to say you know what it goes against our nature sometimes we want to help but it goes our nature to help our enemy to send the bird away multiple times and so on so there's the idea that we need this little extra push on things where something like tzitzis and tefillin it's a physical object you do it you don't do it it's easy uh, Shabbos is a big thing, maybe not get repeated in this way, it gets repeated many, many times in the Torah. Um, and the, the one interesting one, though, and I don't know if it comes up here, 
Um, but of course, relevant right now with Purim is Zahor Tiskor. I'm not sure how that would fit into that because that's not our relation to other people. But you know, maybe again, it is uh, that we have to remember so much with Amalek and in a in a in a bad way, as opposed to these other things where we're helping people. There, we need to wipe out that right. again in this personal relationship. We need this extra push. To thought right, right. So, so I think what you're saying is correct, Manasha. Is that in the case where it is doubled down? In, in other words. Two things, like you said, it's teaching us a lesson of responsibility because we see responsibility on the part of the person who is doing the mitzvah, right? And it's also pushing us to fulfill a mitzvah that we might not otherwise be doing either because we're rationalizing. Why should I do it? Let them go ahead and hire someone for $5. Why should I do it? And sometimes we in Claudius Soil need some encouragement that we should be doing something with shame mitzvah. So by doubling down, it's like someone asked before, what, 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 why two words? Oh, wait a minute, there's two words here. Let me look into this a little bit more carefully and understand why the Torah is telling. Because remember, every word is precious. There's no need to say two words. When you say two words, there's a reason why you say two words. And that reason is to bring forth something in us that we might otherwise sort of slough off. Because after all, you know, everybody has his own achrayas. I'm walking along and I'm, I'm thinking about my business and I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. And all of a sudden, this fellow's got a donkey that's got uh, stuff on it and I'm going to have to waste a half an hour and I'm going to lose my business opportunity. I mean, you go on and on and on. And, and so at the end of the day, what am I accomplishing? So the terrorist says, you know what? This is a balancing test. It's always a balancing test. And I'm going to give you some help by enumerating certain cases where you got to do a double take to make sure that you're doing the right balance. Okay, with tzitzis, we don't have to. With tefillin, we don't have to. But when it comes to ben Adam Lachavero, where you could easily say, you know what, not my issue. Let him go ahead. Let's do this. Let's do that. So I think you're right. I mean, I think there, a lot of this has to do with, and we're going to see the punchline in a minute, and Rashi is going to give us the punchline to what you just said. So let's just uh, get to the bottom here. Um, now the Gemara has a different kasha. Okay, so now we've we've clarified Perika and Teina and all of these different things. Um, um, track the Gemara three lines from the bottom. Lamalila michtav hanitarte, lamalila michtav chaveda. Why do I have to say perika and teina separately? We now know that we have to say both. But why do I have to say them and to say Aveda? And, 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 and why do we have to say um, Aveda? Isn't, isn't, aren't they Avedas? Now, the perika and teina are a form of Aveda, right? Because what you're doing is, um, so, so Rashi says, Lomali lemichta Aveda, Hashavas Aveda lichtov. Oi hai, oi hai, the ligma mine, the hai kula has horus, mom and Yisrael who? Punchline, mom and Yisrael who? We said this last week and we've said it how many times throughout the Gemara? Uh, a, a Yid always has in mind someone else's um, uh, uh, possessions. In other words, one Jew doesn't want to see another Jew harmed. So if you can help him not lose his possession or or, or, or make sure that the value of his possession is intact, that, that's the nature of a yid, okay? He's not oblivious to his friend. So if you're telling me that Perika and Teina are cases where you're helping your friend because you see that he's struggling, so you wanna help him so that he's not struggling and losing, let's say the value of his possession because he, he, can't, he can't load up. And, and, I, and I, okay, What's an Aveda? Aveda is something that you lose and forever you're going to lose it. I come along and I find it and I say, guess what, Ruvain? I found your Aveda. So in other words, I'm being machshiv mom in Yisrael. I am valuing your money. I have no benefit from this. I'm valuing your money and I'm returning it to you. Frek the Gemara. If Pe'ika and Te'ina are doing the same thing, they're valuing mom and Yisrael, as Rashi says. Mom and Yisrael who, why do I need both? Why does the Torah have to give us a separate discourse on Aveda and a separate discourse on Perika and Te'ina? 
let it say one and I'll know the other. Why? Because the underlying point of it is to save mom and Yisrael. That's the whole reason of, of this whole exercise is because we have an obligation to help someone else not lose his money. And, and we've seen that many, many times. That's the Kasher of the Gemara. Lamali says, so, okay, so Zok the Gemara, the Iksiv Rahmona Hanatarte, two lines from the bottom. If the Torah would have only told us Perika and Te'ina, we shouldn't have Tzara, Demora, Isa, Tzara, Dedei, Isa. I would have thought, you know what? There is a Tzar to the owner, and there's a Tzar to the animal. The owner is sitting there helplessly seeing his, his behemoth suffering under the weight, right? And the animal is suffering. So you got a double suffering. Avala Veda, the Tzara, Demora, Isa. Tsar did day lesson, but by a Veda, who is who has Tsar? The owner pats his pocket and says, Oh my gosh, I just lost my 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 diamond watch. So he has Tsar, he lost it. But does the watch have Tsar? The watch itself, the item, does it have Tsar? There's no Tsar. In other words, what he's saying is they're not parallel. In the case of Pietrika and Pina, uh, uh, Tina and Perika, there is there is this trouble in paradise. The animal is hurting, the owner is hurting. There you have an achlayas to help because everybody's hurting. But I would have thought maybe when not everybody's hurting, it's only the uh, the the owner because he lost it, and in some cases he may not even realize it. But let's say he realizes it, but the object itself is inanimate and has no tsar. A malo, I would think that you don't have to return it. Therefore, you have to have a veda. The e ashmin and a veda. Now, what about the other way around? But if you learn a veda, why do we need teina and parika? The ashmin and a veda, mishum de lesa lamora bahade. Then I would say, um, you know why? You know why you need a veda? Um, because where's the owner? The owner's not around. For care, he doesn't even know he lost it. All of a sudden, he finds out he lost it, so he's nowhere to be found. So I would think um, where the owner isn't around, you have an achrayis. Okay, top of lamed aleph from the base. Avol hanet tarte de isel amar bahade. But in the and I think David, you asked this question. But in the case of the perika and teina, the isel amar bahade, the owner is standing there. Rashi, the isel amar de kasu imo. It says emo. In both cases, it says house of emo. How can talk him emo? So clearly he's there. Ema yachzir acher b'nei adam ve'yiskar. He should go ahead and hire somebody. Why is there a chiddush that you have to go ahead and help if he's there? And we know he's there because the pasuk says emo. Let him go and hire someone for a few dollars and help him do it. Why should I impose on you something that I myself as an owner have an achrayis? I should go ahead and pay somebody to help me lift this animal or to or to saddle. Ablahanatat is Lamar Bahade, a Malo Sricha. Now, now I understand why we need both Aveda and Te'ina and Parika, because one cannot be learned out from the other. Even though there's a similarity between all of them, I nevertheless say that there is enough of a chilak that, that the Torah has to double the language to teach us something that I would not otherwise know. Because if it didn't double the language, then I would say, you know what? I get it. Aveda, I have to help because the poor guy lost it. And for all he knows, he doesn't know where he lost it. So if, if it comes to me, I have an applies to give him back. But Te'ina and Parika, why should I go ahead and help him when he, he's able-bodied or he's able to afford a few dollars to help someone uh, uh, help him lift it? Why is it on me, the mitzvah? Teretz is, there is a mitzvah on you. And again, if you're if you're a chassid, and, uh, we said with the Shur Sadin and all these other things, then you should jump in before he has an opportunity to pay someone to help him and say, you know what? I'm here. I'm going to help you. So the, that's the Gemara's Teretz as to why you have to do it. Um, okay. So, so, um, okay. So, so now we understand why we need both of them. In all of these cases, again, it's 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 a mental exercise to go through all of these psukim so that we can fully understand why the Torah is doubling up in these particular cases.
Okay, so let's learn a couple more because uh, the Gemara goes down uh, a bit with this. Um, the next one is the Pasuk in the Torah, Mos Yumos. In other words, the Torah tells us that if someone goes ahead and kills somebody else, then, then you have to uh, put him to death. And we know that there are Arbamesis, there are four capital um, punishments, Skila, Sreifa, Herod, Vechenek, and, and for each Avera, there is a designated Mesa. It's not random. So for, for instance, if a person killed somebody else, then uh, uh, he gets Herod. So he is killed through Herod, which is uh, the sword uh, or some derivative of the sword. Okay. Um, uh, says the Gemara, most you must, Hamake, Engli Ella, but Misa Haksuva Bo. I know that he is Chayiv for the Misa that is designated to him, meaning he has to get Herod. Minayin, Shimiata, Yachal, Hamisa, but Misa Haksuva Bo. How do I know I can substitute Misas? There's a reason why the Torah designates one of the cardinal principles of, of, of death to a particular thing. So there, there is a shaykhus, there is a connection. How do I know that I can violate that connection? Maybe if I can't, if I, can't, uh, I believe in capital punishment, um, if, which let's say electrocution. One of, in this country, you electrocute. Now, I believe that the, the law of the land is that if, we call him Old Sparky, if Old Sparky doesn't work, then he's absolved from capital punishment. You can no longer put him to death. He has to have life imprisonment. I believe that's the law here. Now, if that's the law, the, the, the why over here do we say, what's the kasha? Kasha is, he's mechoyev to have hereg because he killed somebody. You can't do hereg. Let him live out his life in prison. Why, why, why is there a chiyuv to kill him? <clears throat> why is there a chiyuv to find another source of Misa? So that's the glorious Kasha here. How do I know that you can do that? The answer is you can, but how do I know? Shem ati yochal ha-misa ha-misa ha-ksubabo tata b'shol ha-misa b'chol misha ati yochal ha-misa so therefore it says, it says most you must, that the second you must emphasizes that if you can't get him one way, uh, um, you get him another way. So let's look at Rashi, Shimiyati Yochel Misa, the second Rashi, the Misa Ksuvabo, the Hamasayev, that's using the sword, Kogon Shehoya Bisfina, let's say he was being sent uh, in, in a boat where, um, where he was being sent to, to prison and there he was going to be killed, let's say. Okay, he was going to Uboreach and he escaped. The Atayocha Lizrot Bochets, and you can shoot an arrow at him, or Lotovo, or you can drown him. How do I know that if you can shoot an arrow at him or drown him, that that's okay? Maybe I have to, because he, he escaped the sword, he escaped capital punishment. Therefore, the Torah says, most you must in any way possible. Talmud Loma, most you must. Mikol Maka. Okay, so again, we see that the double wording gives us that extra um, that um, uh, th that extra impetus that um, okay now we have another pasuk we'll, we'll do one more we have another pasuk that says hako um, take uh, that you can um, uh, you can um, also that you can smite him to different pasuk and that uh, comes to tell us that um, uh, you, you can hire that you have to use the particular maka that is hakra taka as yoshba. Okay, so, so, so this possible has to do with let's say you go to irni dachas, let's say you go to a, 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 a city that is worshiping idols, different, it's the same principle but a different mitzvah. In other words, you have to wipe out everybody in an area. Dachas, you can't let anybody live. So the Torah tells us, you have to use the chorev, the sword, to kill everybody in the, in the city. It happens to be the same, the same utensil, the sword, but different reason. In other words, 
even by Irani Dachas, it's telling us that if you can't get him to Hakotake, then um, then uh, you're allowed to use any other um, uh, form of, um, of, uh, of of Misa. We're not limited just to that. Okay, so again, the Gemara goes on for a little bit further. We can go further and, and, and do some more uh, until we get to the bottom of the daf. Rabbi? Yeah. I want to go back. So we left uh, the concept of Aveda, and I'm still struggling with the fact that um, if the owner is there or the owner is aware of the Aveda, and or if if an animal is burdened, I can understand helping the owner with um, relieving the burden, getting the animal to stand up, putting a sa saddle on. But why does uh, why do I and not the owner take precedence in terms of responsibility over the owner who's aware of all these things and? If the owner doesn't act, why do I have to step into his shoes to do all those things that are his responsibility? Yes, I have empathy. Yes, I can help. But if, if he doesn't move, why do I have to move in place? So that's an excellent question. And the question really has two sides to it. Because number one, <clears throat> the Torah is teaching you and I the mitzvah of of Derek Eretz and what it means to have responsibility for a fellow Jew. So even though you're 100% right, you see a healthy, um, healthy fellow and he is not um, doing anything to help himself, your question is, why should I do something that he should otherwise be doing or hiring people or anybody else? So the first part of the answer is the Torah is teaching us a, a the mitzvah of Derech Eretz, how we should comport ourselves regardless of somebody else, because how do you know that even though he looks fully healthy and capable, that he really is capable? And for instance, if he is, if, uh, uh, I mean, let me give you an example. Uh, Rabbi Einimer had, had a, was holding packages, <clears throat> the packages fell down. And you see Rabbi Einimer, and he's a, a tall, healthy man, and you say, you know what? Let the rub, the rub can pick him up. I mean, it's not such a big thing that I have to go out of my way. I'm in the middle of doing something else. So, Lechaira, you're right. He's fully capable of doing it. Or if not, he can call over a Talmud or he can say to a fellow, here's $5. Do you mind helping me carry this to my car? All legitimate. The Torah is going out of its way to tell us that all of those things are correct. You made a good point. They're all correct. He should be doing it. He should be helping himself. He should be hiring somebody. Notwithstanding, the Torah is teaching us derech Eretz, that since we have a responsibility for our, for our friend, we shouldn't look at the obvious and say, he's not doing it, why should I? We should always take the position, especially with these mitzvahs, where there is a gray area, because we don't know underneath it why he isn't doing it, that we should jump into action. Why? Because of the words in Rashi, because Rashi says, as Horus Maman Yisrael who, it is a warning that you have an Achrayas to protect Maman Yisrael. Now, you're gonna ask, why should I protect his money if he doesn't protect it himself? That's a valid question. So the Torah, the Gemara gave us one answer. You remember the Gemara said that if the circumstance comes between your money and my money, my money comes first. I have to take care of my possession because I shouldn't become a poor guy. So you see that there is an exception to that rule when it impinges me. But if my money is not at stake and I'm not going to be hurt here, this is, a, this is the Torah teaching us Derek Eretz, that you have a responsibility and look away at what seems to be the obvious. Why isn't he doing it? He should be doing it himself. And the Torah says, maybe he should, maybe he shouldn't. But I have an opportunity for a mitzvah. I should take the mitzvah. Later on, it'll turn out, you know what? He could have done it. So what? Am, am, am I going to have charata that I did a mitzvah? Okay, fine. I did a mitzvah. I, you know, the guy could have done it himself. I did a mitzvah. I get schar. So this is really teaching us the Torah by using these psukim and by emphasizing this 
is teaching us that this is the way you should conduct your life. You should never have a down the cap chaver. You should always give your friend the benefit of the doubt and say, there's a reason I could walk along the street and look perfectly healthy. And maybe I've got a, 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 a terrible back pain and I cannot lift anything. But I look like I'm healthy. I look like I can do it, but I can't do it. And I, I'm not going to go around and announce I have back pain. I can't do it. So maybe it's, it's embarrassing for me to say something. So you see it and you say, you know what? I don't care. He can't do it. I'm going to jump in and do it. This is really what separates, what makes a yid a yid is that, is that he has that extra empathy to somebody else. And, and you know what? The Torah has to tell us that because if the Torah didn't tell us in this double language, I might have thought, I'm like everybody else. You know, the Torah says I should help, but if I can't help and he helps himself, okay, he helps himself. The Torah, and, and that's an answer to maybe the Menachem's question or someone else, that by doubling it, it makes you stop and think for a minute, why is, it, why is the Torah saying that? Why is the Torah giving us a double helping of the same word? Torah says, in some cases, it has a different reason. And in some cases, it is to tell us that you have an achrayas, even if the owner doesn't own up to his own achrayas, you still have an achrayas to help him, even if he's slouching off and saying, you know what, I'm going to sit and smoke a Cuban cigar and you're going to go ahead and work. So I think that that's really, this is a, right. a yeah, it's, it's a message. Yeah. Okay, so um, my money is more important than your money. I shouldn't go broke to, to help you out. Correct. There's an opportunity cost too. I'm in a hurry. I have something else that I have to do. It's if I'm doing, if I'm helping you, I can't do what I need to do for myself. Correct. So opportunity cost, doesn't that play in? Yes, it does. And, and we're going to see uh, uh, from the Mishnah and from the Gemara to that Mishnah next week, where opportunity cost comes in, because you're absolutely right. You have to look at the whole picture and you have to say, okay, I have to, I have to balance my interests and your interests. And opportunity cost, uh, while it's not as clear, um, also technically falls into the general category, category of my money versus your money. In other words, if, if, if by losing that opportunity, I'm losing money, which could hurt me, then that also becomes lost money. In other words, it doesn't have to be the instant you lose the money right this second. Um, it's, it's, you know, if, if, if I do this and I'm not there by two o'clock, I'll lose a huge amount of money. That comes into the category of it's my money. But, right. still, <laughs> down the kashus, but just because of that, you don't have to be a kuni lemo, you know? Right, right, exactly, exactly. And that, that opportunity. So, that, this happens more frequently. We get this opportunity quite often when a neighbor has a flat tire. And sure, they can call a mechanic to come or the AAA, but if you can go help them, this is a perfect example of this situation that we're talking about. Right, right. And, and this falls into the general <coughs> category that we learned, mitzvah habar biyod al taka. In other words, whenever you have a mitzvah that comes uh, to, to your hand, you shouldn't push it off and say, oh, I'll do it later or let someone else do the mitzvah. In other words, this is all part of our education of how we are taught as, as a yidin that we have responsibilities to ourselves, to our fellow man, and that when the Torah gives us mitzvahs, they, they, they're not option one, option two. A mitzvah is not, is not an optional command. It is a command. Now, there are a few times when you, that mitzvah, you can override that mitzvah. One of them we just said now, my money versus your money. Okay, I have a mitzvah to help you, but not at my expense. So there we have a way of overriding the mitzvah. But, but short of those few exceptions, the Torah tells us you have a mitzvah, you know, now we say that one mitzvah does another mitzvah. If you're in the middle of a mitzvah, you, you then you don't have to do another mitzvah because you're in the mi mitzvah is your your potter from another mitzvah. But if you're doing the mitzvah and something comes to your hand and you have the ability to fulfill that mitzvah and the other mitzvah, of course it's a judgment call. But you have to make that judgment. But the Torah is telling us if you're doing a mitzvah, Isaac the mitzvah potter min a mitzvah. Now you have, you have no obligation to do another mitzvah because you're in the middle of one. But these are all questions that each one of us have to use our own intelligence and say, you know what, I'm doing a mitzvah. Uh, maybe I can chop a rind on this other mitzvah or not. So right. uh, another example might be, you know, you're, you're rushing to Minyan 
uh, and you know, it's mincha time, you're going to run out of time. And the middle on the way, you have this situation with helping somebody come up, uh, you know, so it's this trade off. Uh, and they already, you taught that they already dive in mincha, so they're no rush for that. You know, they're not worried about that. But to me, right. you know, so you have to balance, right. figure out yeah. it's not just money. I think you might have a mitzvah to rise against a mitzvah to rub on in there. Well, okay, so, so now you have to weigh that if you have a mitzvah to rise against a mitzvah to rub on, but there are times, there are times when, when look, you, you're, you're rushing along, <clears throat> you want to go to a minion, and you see someone who has fallen and, 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 and uh, he's bloodied and he's lying on the ground and you say, you know what? Someone else will come and help him. I got to go, I got to go and, and, and that will be <laughs> so, so, so there, you know, it's, it's more of a, of a, of a dramatic uh, uh, dichotomy because you're immediately going to help someone or fulfill the mitzvah of, um, of tefillah. So again, there's not one right answer always. Sometimes your instinct will tell you, this is a mitzvah, uh, I really have to jump into this mitzvah. And of course, at the end of the day, we hope the Rabbi Shalom looks upon us and says, you know, we, we did the right answer. Not all of us necessarily stop and categorize. Wait a minute, mitzvah A is this, mitzvah B is this, which mitzvah? We, we don't stop and do that. Sometimes instinctively, we jump to a mitzvah, even if maybe, and again, in, in our mind, we can't say one mitzvah is more important than another mitzvah, right? Shaluch HaKain, which they say, if you make a Shaluch HaKain, that seems to be a very simple mitzvah. We learned about it earlier. What happens if you, you're, you're, you're running along and then you see the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the, the animal? So what should you do? Should you stop and do Shaluch HaKain and then, mitzv- and then miss Mishachris uh, or, or miss another mitzvah? Another, these are all difficult questions. And Bishas Maisa, we have to make some decisions. You know, not everybody is totally versed with a, a list of which mitzvah comes before another mitzvah because we don't know mitzvah kala and mitzvah and mitzvah chamura. Uh, so, so sometimes a mitzvah kala can have much more impact than a mitzvah. You know, a simple mitzvah can have more impact than a mitzvah chamura than a harder mitzvah. So, uh, what, what we hope for is that we we understand the underlying principle, which is that kol yisrael aravim zelos there that we are all intertwined to help each other. And whenever the opportunity presents itself, we should help each other. And hopefully we are um, we're doing, we're doing what's right. And Mitzvah Shem, the uh, Baruch will give us the right schar for the right mitzvah. So we'll stop here by Hoshev Kashev. And uh, Mitzvah Shem will, will finish this sugya next week and go on. Uh, but again, we see from, 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 the, from the Gemara, that especially this particular section that um, the Torah the, 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 the Torah really has um, and because the Torah doesn't use extra words very often that we have to take this all very very detailed and understand that when the Torah is telling us something like this there's deep down there's, there's it's not su- just superficial there's a real reason why the Torah is giving us this hakofa and telling us in in um, in double language, uh, what we have to do. So I wish everybody a prayer yeah. for him. We should we should talk in a hapacha. We're we're living in a time when uh, we need a, a, a lot of chizuk and maybe a lot of double words from the Torah. Uh, <laughs> and, and hopefully, uh, Purim will give us the Yeshua for Klal Yisrael and then hopefully the Yeshua for the whole world because Amen. our responsibility to other Yidin also goes. To Kolbene Adam. In other words, we we can't turn a blind eye to people who aren't uh, Jewish because that's our Rafael. So hopefully the Shalom will give us that kayak and we'll all be Zaycha. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks Menasha. Kayam. Yeah. Speaking of double classic double words, a uh, hired killer and enters now enters the pantheon. Okay, yes, I, I asked Rick privately um, if you um, have someone do your work for you and he uh, sustains a hernia, is that a, uh, a hired killer? But okay, never mind. Right. <laughs> let it go, let it go. Let it go. All right. <laughs>